All right, everyone, I'm Lauren James, and today on Sunday, September 20th, we're going to cover the introduction to mortgage-backed securities. To kick things off, let's talk about securitization more broadly. Securitization is for any stream of cash flows to be securitized, tranched, and then sold out to investors, which will then increase the demand universe for the debt and lower the cost of funds and cost of borrowing for the people that are taking on this debt. Banks originate mortgage loans and then sell a selection of them to a trust, like an SPV or an SPT, which for our terms are synonymous. The trust then assembles all of these loans and puts them into collections, so-called pools, which then receive a guarantee or credit enhancement during this process, which represents the seniority in the debt stack and the amount of safety and protection that this debt has. In addition, the securities, the resulting bonds and notes, are issued and backed by the mortgages, and investors receive monthly cash flows, both principal and interest from the underlying mortgages. We'll get to this in later lectures, but monthly cash flows can be principal only and interest only as well, which create PO and IO strips, respectively. Moving on to securitization for mortgages in particular, why are they securitized and what does an MBS represent? MBS represents a claim on the cash flows from underlying mortgage loans that have been securitized less the servicing fees. This provides essential funds for residential mortgage loans in the United States and helps reduce interest rates for borrowers, ordinary people like you and me. This increases the availability of the loans and equalizes mortgage rates, making things more equitable. In addition, this eliminates region regional funding disparities by creating this worldwide market for mortgage loans. Things are now more standardized because if Fannie and Freddie are going to buy these loans, these standard loans, they're going to all need to be relatively similar. They're going to have similar LTV profiles with LTVs below 80. You're going to have similar DTIs around 36% at least. You're going to have or at least under 36% or less. In addition, you're going to have um, prime borrowers have at least a 660 FICO store. And with that in mind, we're further boosting the rate of home ownership and thus strengthening America's democracy. Research studies have actually also shown that when Americans have an economic stake in their communities, such as through mortgage payments and actually owning and get earning equity by paying mortgage payments in their home, they're more likely to go out and vote and practice the fund fundamental tenet of what makes America, America. In addition, from the investor's point of view, we want to answer the question of why should we buy mortgage-backed securities? We see higher returns, better credit quality, a variety of investment profiles, and enhanced liquidity, which all are great reasons for investors to choose to purchase and invest in mortgage-backed securities. MBS typically yield a little bit over T plus 100, which means 100 basis points over treasuries, and also outperform comparatively rate, rated corporate bonds. Credit quality is very high across the board because of both explicit and implicit guarantees by the federal government. Ginnies have no credit risk, so they're basically the same guarantee as uh, treasuries because they're backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Fannie and Freddie, the GSEs, the government-sponsored enterprises, have low credit risk as well because they're implicitly backed by the U.S. government. Securities are often rated as high as AAA, AA, and single A as well. We see massive portions of these, of these um, resulting security capital structures being incredibly concentrated in the AAA, with sometimes as much as 96, 97% of the loans being on um, that AAA category. Major credit rating agencies will rate these notes on the RMBS side, whether that's uh, your Fitch or your uh, Moody's or your S&P, but there are also smaller credit agencies like a Morningstar or Curl that'll play more in the esoteric ABS space. Considering investment profiles, we see things like strips. Strips are, as mentioned before, IOs and POs, where you have interest only and principal only portions, which can actually have negative, short, or very long durations, which give broad investment profiles. We also see varying coupons, either being uh, fixed, zero, floating, or inversely floating. We have arms where there are adjustable rate mortgages and can increase dramatically as well. And prepayment sensitivities also range. These are indicated by the CPR numbers and your percentage of PSA. 
Considering liquidity, trading volume is second only to the US Treasury market, so it's absolutely huge. Because of this liquidity, we see tiny bid ask spreads, which is really important for people to be able to transact quickly in large sizes and maintain their position size. In addition, the Fed has now basically backstopped the market, coming in as recently as in March 2020, and also coming in through the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis of 2008, to buy these mortgage-backed securities when you see a lot of real estate debt funds come under times of stress and end up seeing strains in their dollar roll spreads, making them much wider and the cost of funding higher. We see this, main, uh, this activity of high liquidity being maintained, especially in the TBA pools, and we'll get to that in a second. About um, $9 trillion of the $14 trillion in mortgage loans outstanding are securitized in mortgage-backed securities. This is huge. What's that? About 65% of mortgage loans are securitized in mortgage-backed securities. This includes both the agency, which are Fannie, Freddie, the GSEs, and Ginny, the um, non-GSE part of the HUD portion of agency-backed security markets. In addition, we see non-agencies, which are the private label, the non-qualified mortgage, and the RMBS, which are pretty much synonymous terms for our usage today. Considering the flow of funds, we want to talk about how we're creating securities from home loans. With the homeowners flowing through, through the mortgage payments from the homeowners flowing through to the mortgage originator and servicer flowing them through to the trustee, which then uh, translates that to the investors. The homeowners through a broker will pay money to a place like Wells Fargo or your local bank, whether that's we're in Florida, maybe it's a fifth third bank or some other smaller local bank. Uh, I go to university in Pittsburgh, so uh, their PNC is one of the big mortgage originators. So you walk into your local branch, say, hey, I need a mortgage and they're going to originate the mortgage and then service the mortgage. For bigger pools, we also see things like special servicers come in, which basically means that if something goes long and my loan starts not performing, it becomes an NPL. We'll have a workout group in the bank come in and help me through this process and figure out if we can change the covenants on the terms, see if we can change any sort of characteristics of the loan to make it able to be prepaid easier or to make it able to be repaid easier and also maintain that status. The mortgage-backed security issuer is a bank like Goldman Sachs, which is an investment bank. We see uh, the issuer actually create these securities on the primary origination side by pulling together whatever, two, three, four thousand mortgages into one trust, which will go to a place like Deutsche Bank. A place like Deutsche Bank will manage this trust on behalf of the investors and disperse the payments and report the status of the loans. This plays an imperative role, and for this, they're going to take a fee. They also arrange the capital structure and structure it in such a way where you'll have predominantly AAA or predominantly top-rated notes at the top, which are the most senior tranches that will benefit more from foreclosure because they are paid first. Junior tranches are going to favor the modifications to increase the likelihood that they will be paid. The trust is, again, sliced into these segments with most of that uh, money being concentrated in the senior most class, as you can see in the picture here. 96.5% of the debt is in this AAA, this senior class. We have a tiny sliver of equity and small portions of other subordinated debt. This support is also known as credit enhancement, which is the C slash E figure that you'll oftentimes see on FinSight. Considering the accounting equation, if you've taken a basic accounting class, you'll know that assets equal the sum of liabilities plus equity. Considering the asset side, that's the accounts receivable, that's the rent payments, that's the mortgage payments that's going into this trust that's funding the asset side of the equation. On the equity side, this is the, uh, the homeowner's equity or post-crisis, we also see the maintenance of an equity portion by the primary issuer. Considering the debt, this is what's sold out to investors. You see different types of risk retention that can be done, either horizontal or vertical, where you're taking either portions of the tranches or taking a bottom sliver right above the equity. But uh, to focus on the majority of the capital structure, the majority of the debt stack, we see these notes being sold out to investors in these different tranches. The senior most notes, as you would imagine, are the least risky, which means they do also yield less. The junior most notes are more risky, which means they yield more risk and reward. It's the typical thing in finance. 
To move on, let's review fixed income so we can go into the fact that mortgage-backed securities and other callable bonds are short convexity. Duration, before we can get to convexity, let's talk about the first derivative. Duration is a summary of the effective average maturity dates. This means that if you're duration hedged, you're gonna be hedged from interest rate risk within small changes in yields. And this caveat is incredibly important. This only applies locally. Within the local region, you are hedged. You have a tangent line approximation and near that area in that it was small moves in either direction, that's gonna be fine. So if you are duration hedged, you will have eliminated interest rate sensitivity. Your duration is going to be longest when you have lower coupons or no coupons because it's your weighted average of those payment dates, weighted average of the discounted value of your payments. Um, in addition, the longer your time to maturity, the longer your duration is going to be, which makes sense. However, if you look at equation like the duration of a perpetuity, we'll see that the duration of a perpetuity is equal to one plus y divided by y. So for a yield of 10%, to get yield of 10%, price of 100, you'll have a duration value of 11, which is how you'd hedge, you'd hedge it with a comparable based um, non-perpetuity. Uh, fixed income asset that does also have a duration of 11 and obviously selling that to end up with positive 11 minus negative 11 equaling zero. However, obviously a perpetuity does not have a maturity date. So using the proxy of, of Macaulay duration where your um, time to maturity is going to be equal to that um, your time to maturity is going to be equal to duration is effectively incorrect. And with that in mind, we will use your effective duration. Bonds and yield, uh, bond prices and yields obviously have an inverse relationship. As you can see by this duration approximation on the, le on the left hand side of your screen, on the top right box. Considering the box on the top left though, you see that the bond price actually has curvature. It has something called convexity, where on the lower end, when yields, uh, yields fall, we see prices rise by even more than they would be expected based on their tangent line approximation. This is for a 0% bond as you see here. However, if you have a 9% coupon, you're going to lower that duration. Greater duration means greater risk. Lower duration means lower risk. When uh, bonds are at a discount, we see that you are trading below par, which means price is less than 100. Usually bonds are quoted on a $100 $100 face. With regard to a premium, that's going to be trading above 100. Lower duration means that you're getting more of your money sooner, which makes it less risky. Longer maturity means higher duration, and lower coupon means higher duration. Considering the second derivative, convexity, we're going to look at modified duration and convexity. This tangent line approximation represents modified duration, with convexity being the indication of this line. This is positive convexity. This is not a mortgage-backed security. This is positive convexity. Typical bonds are going to be positive convexity. This is, this is an indication of positive convexity. We see that the convexity adjustment, the difference between the actual convex line and the tangent line approximation is greater on the upside than on the downside. And the size of the adjustment is proportional to the change in interest. Um, the idea is that when you have a lower coupon, you're gonna actually become more convex. And the modified duration is going to be that tangent line approximation. However, the lower no coupon bonds are gonna have the greatest interest rate volatility and uh, callable bonds nearing call price are going to have that negative convexity. Um, do pay attention to the caveat of nearing call price because the option is only gonna have that value if it's going to be early and have a material value if you are near that strike price. And with mortgage-backed securities being in such a local range and yields being low with whatever, 30-year mortgage rates being a little bit under 3% right now, we see low rates across the board. Um, even if they're higher, it's still not gonna be more than whatever, six, seven, eight percent So we can use this local approximation to say that um, callable bonds are gonna have negative convexity when we're talking about mortgage-backed securities. Applying convexity, we see that convexity is good. We want to be long convexity. Being long convexity is awesome. The more positive convexity, the better. Positive convexity is going to cushion a bond's price fall and accelerate the price rise, as you see here on the chart on the left. 
Callable bonds, again, like mortgage-backed security within small changes in local yields, are going to be short convexity, meaning that price falls are going to be accelerated and price rises are cushioned. This is bad. This is a problem and one of the reasons that mortgage-backed securities are such complex products. So why are mortgage-backed securities short convexity? Simple answer you have exposure to prepayment risk. The exposure to prepayment risk is characterized by the homeowner having the right and ability to prepay, basically pay extra principal at any time without a penalty. In this world of CMBS, you see things like prepayment penalties. You see non-call provisions and prepayment penalty points, which all indicate things that are supposed to disincentivize this early prepayment. One of the reasons that this will happen in the CMBS world is because there are so many, or I guess so many fewer uh, corporate loans that go into, or I guess commercial mortgages that go into the CMBS structured product. However, on um, the resi side, we'll see whatever, two, three, 4,000 mortgages go into one of these pools, as opposed to the CMBS side where you could have a SASB, single asset, single borrower, that literally would only have one asset, or you have something that might be a little bit bigger, uh, whatever, 10, 30, 50 loans in the pool. For resis, they are still able to have the ability to prepay extra principal at any time without penalty, which makes prepayment risk even more important here. Considering uh, the chart on the left, we see a dotted line that's going to represent the effective duration with respect to changes in the benchmark curve. So when we see yield change on the bottom, this is for the benchmark curve. For mortgage-backed securities, residential mortgage-backed securities, that's going to be the treasury curve. Typically, we'll see yields about whatever treasuries plus 100, T plus 100 basis points. And um, this differs from modified duration, which is going to be based on changes in the bond's own yield to maturity. This is based on the benchmark curves yield changes. Anyhow, considering the situation where we're duration matched with small changes in yields, which is this area locally over here, they move with the benchmark one-on-one. -on -one. So the mortgage-backed security, the black line, is very close to both the dotted line and the red line. However, with big changes in yields, this does not hold. And notably, it holds a lot more on the upside than it does on the downside. So if you're hedging a mortgage-backed security by going long an MBS and short at treasury, that's gonna become more problematic when rates fall because when rates fall, this differential is going to get substantially larger. Obviously, as you can see in this picture, as opposed to positive convexity like other bonds, this is negative convexity. You are short convexity. This is bad and this is a big problem. So why does prepayment risk occur? We say that negative, pre and negative convexity occurs because of prepayment risk, but why does this happen? So prepayment risk is most frequently, uh, I guess mortgages are most frequently prepaid when there are falling interest rates. In a lower interest rate environment, people are incentivized to refinance because if I have a mortgage and I'm paying 5% coupons, and now I can go get a new mortgage that's at 2.9, I'm gonna wanna get the new mortgage. And um, so you're going to refinance into a term and into a loan that has better terms, either with regard to rate, maturity, better bank, better incentives. Something is going to encourage that switch. Extra principal prepayments can actually occur at any time over the life of a mortgage. This is known as curtailment or partial prepayment, in the sense that you can pay money up front and or pay a little bit extra every month and get that principal payment down a little bit. However, because this is a securitized product and these cash flows are being sold to investors also through IOs and POs, we see the idea of, uh, I guess, the unknown nature of when the cash flows is coming being problematic because you're only getting the interest on the principal outstanding. So if the principal outstanding decreases, then the amount of interest is also going to decrease in turn. With falling interest rates, we also see that, or I guess in addition to refinancing because of falling interest rates, people can also sell a house. It's a house. Houses get sold because of relocation, new jobs, new schools, divorces, deaths, or you could just pay off early because you feel like it. There are so many different reasons that you can uh, prepay. It's um, definitely a big exercise that people love to forecast, and it does effectively determine the value of a mortgage-backed security. In addition, we see the component of seasonality. We see trends where over the summer, people are more likely to move, but over the winter and the fall, 
Probably not because, you know, I don't know, kids are back in school and in pre-COVID times when people were in actual classrooms, they needed to be in that same school. So people oftentimes uh, move over the summer or possibly winter break, but less likely during the school months. In addition, you could default or foreclose on the loan, which is another issue for um, prepayment risk. To put it in other terms, more financially mathematic terms, we see that a callable bond, mortgage-backed security uh, pass-through, is the equivalent of buying a long bond and shorting an option because you are short the optionality. As the owner of the security, you are short the optionality. If you take one thing away from the session, know that you are short the optionality when you have a mortgage-backed security because the homeowner can decide to repay whenever they want. The homeowner borrower has the right to re prepay whenever they want, which means you are gonna be short convexity. So considering uh, the actual measurements of prepayment, some things to note are PSA, CPR, and SMMs. Considering CPRs, if you take one prepayment measure away, take CPRs. CPRs are the conditional prepayment rate, which are noted annually. And it's the loan prepayment rate at, ri at which a pool of loans, the MBS's outstanding principal, is paid off on an annual basis. The higher the CPR, the more prepayments are anticipated, which means lower duration. The single monthly mortality is the equivalent of that on a monthly basis. So using a 112th adjustment, we are making that number monthly. Usually when you see mortgage-backed securities quoted, the most important number will be CPR, which is sometimes quoted as a proportion of the PSA rate. The PSA, the Public Securities Association, has a 6% a year benchmark prepayment rate for 30-year mortgages after a 30-month period. So the time in months, if it's less than 30 months, is going to be the CPR, uh, this CPR is going to be equal 6% times T over 30. The idea here is best described with this chart. So with a 100% PSA, that means once you hit this 30 month mark, so two and a half years in, we're gonna have this constant prepayment rate of 6%. 50% means it's gonna be half, and obviously 150% is the other direction, meaning that the CPR is gonna max out at nine. However, there are problematic um, characteristics of this assumption, such as burnout. Burnout is a term that describes the slower prepayment rates if older coupons um, are trading at a premium, even though, like take an example, it's a 30 year mortgage, you're 25 years in and you haven't paid in advance. You're probably not gonna decide to prepay it now because rates are more attractive. In the 30 year period, you probably had more attractive rates at some point over the life of your mortgage. You, If you were someone that was gonna actively try to prepay, you probably would have done it already. If you were um, thinking of moving, you probably didn't keep the house for 25 years and then decide to switch jobs. So as you go later, and obviously those things could still happen, you could still refi, there's no rule against it. However, trends um, indicate that the burnout is going to be highest towards the end of the life of the mortgage. So obviously the PSA convention does not include this and actual mortgages don't typically follow the PSA convention, but it's something that market participants use, understand, and it's essentially just a quirk of the market. It's very important to know. Uh, payment speeds are typically stated in terms of CPR, and we'll see things ranging from whatever this three, six, nine percent. Those are all typical depending on the issuances, depending on the coupon, and depending on the age, time to maturity, and all of that. With regard to the graphical representation of prepayment, I'd love to direct your attention to the graph on the top left. We see that interest payments make up a majority of uh, your monthly payment in the early months. Um, you see that, so the idea is you're paying interest on whatever outstanding principal that you have. Your outstanding principal is going to be highest at the beginning and at the end, it's gonna be the lowest. So your principal is gonna make up the most towards the end. However, in early stages, that'll be the opposite. Your servicing payment is also higher at the beginning and will get lower over time. It gets lower monotonically. And considering the situation with a CPR of 100% PSA, this means that we're gonna rise over 30 months, increasing to get to that 6% level, and then staying at that 6% level after that two and a half year mark, all the way to the maturity. This means that each year you're gonna have that amount of prepayments, that 6% prepayment rate, 
And the idea is that you're still going to have the earlier payments being mostly principal. However, as you go out further, that is going to monotonically decrease, as well as seeing a peak in prepayments around years three, four, and five. Moving on, we see the relationships with parallel shifts in interest rates. Again, we're using effective duration, which means that it is based on the idea of parallel shifts in the yield curve. That means for mortgage-backed securities, we'll look to the treasury curve and see the movements in the treasury curve and see how that affects the CPR, the price, the effective duration, and effective convexity. Considering the CPR percentage, we see a huge movement when yields to go to the downside with spiking CPR rates. However, when you go to the upside, we see um, obviously falling CPR, but not to the same magnitude as the difference in CPR on the downside in terms of yield. We see this massive movement up on the downside, however, really muted movement on the upside. Part of the reason for this is this effective convexity. Considering, um, and also the idea is that we're gonna have refinancing, when rates go lower, and obviously it's not gonna have as big of an effect on the um, upper side of the yield curve. In addition, considering uh, the price movements, considering convexity, we see prices rise a little bit when yields fall across the yield curve. However, on the um, upside in terms of yield movements, we've seen prices fall even more. So the idea is the good movement is a rise in price and that's gonna be muted because of this increase in prepayment. However, on the upside in yields, we're gonna see a massive movement here, which is basically bad. This put simply, that's bad. And that is because of this over here, the effective convexity. Considering price quotations, I do wanna note that you have a discount bond that is trading lower than the current coupon. So if I'm looking at a 2% coupon bond, that's gonna be trading at a discount to par which means the price is gonna be below 100. If it is the current coupon, then it'll be trading at par, and if it's a higher coupon, it'll be trading at a premium, which means the price will be over than 100. So discount less than 100, par at 100, premium above 100. Considering effective duration, we see effective duration increase substantially on the upside in terms of yields, but let's say relatively muted once you go below 100 basis point change, in the yields on the downside. Considering convexity, we have this weird phenomenon when you move out at least 200 basis points on either side, where convexity actually becomes positive. However, this is more of a theoretical concept because you're not really gonna see this before you adjust your dynamic hedge. You're not gonna have something move a full 2% before you change your dynamic hedge. So that's not necessarily as important for this discussion, but theoretically, obviously it does happen, so it's great to know. However, the biggest thing, again, about these pass-through securities, <coughs> sorry, is that you're gonna be short uh, convexity in this local area. Considering uh, types of mortgage-backed securities, Let's look at agency MBS. Agency MBS is one of the biggest types of mortgage-backed securities. It includes Freddie, Fannie, and Ginny securities. Uh, Freddie and Fannie are government-sponsored enterprises where Freddie decides to buy mortgage loans from smaller banks and credit unions called thrifts. They're responsible for the losses themselves, like Fannie as well. Fannie was created first. Let's go chronologically. Fannie was created part of FDR's New Deal in 1938. And um, Ginny was created after that in 68. And then in 1970, Freddie Mac was created. Freddie and Fannie are brother organizations and are thus incredibly similar. Considering Freddie, we see that, or Freddie and Fannie, they both have the implicit backing of the US government. This means that they are not directly part of the government. However, they are uh, backed implicitly. They are a government-sponsored enterprise and have taken uh, loans and the government now has warrants that can be exercised for a controlling stake in both Fannie and Freddie. Freddie was created to be a competitor to Fannie to push down its fees and then charge further lower mortgage costs. If loans are at least 90 days delinquent in either Fannie or Freddie, they are required to take them out of the pool. So we see loans being taken out of the pool when they're delinquent, which is also uh, shown in similar conditions as higher at CPRs, which is something that we've seen recently. 
When loans are taken out of the pool, obviously the pool is going to shrink, which means lower principal payments and lower interest payments to the note holders of the resulting securities. In addition, it's great to note that Fannie and Freddie buy about 66% of all of American mortgages, and Ginny Mae is a little bit different than the other two. Ginny Mae is part of the federal HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, and has issuers that are actually responsible for the bad debt themselves. The guarantor is federally backed, and they like to buy non-conventional loans, the FHA, the VA, the RD, the PIH, the USDA, anything that's a little bit different than just a mid-size um, conventional conforming loan for a medium income borrower. We see the Federal uh, Housing Association do low income borrowers, veterans with the VA, um, Indians with the PIH, American Indian uh, tribal populations, and USDA for agriculture as well. And considering relative loss positions by agency, on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see GSEs. GSEs include Fannie and Freddie. And obviously, across both pictures, you see homeowners equity being hit first. If you have a mortgage that has an ADLT, the first 20%, the 20% down payment that you put up, LTV meaning loan to value, the first 20% that you put up is going to be the homeowner's equity. That homeowner's equity can be uh, is going to be the first dollar loss in value. So before private mortgage insurance gets to that, you have that homeowner's equity. As you make principal payments, which when you make monthly payments that include principal and interest, you are increasing the equity of your home that you now own. Because when you are making that principal payment, you are gaining equity. Considering that, you have your equity, then you have your private mortgage insurance. On the Ginnie Mae side, that is the government agency insurance. And if you look to Freddie and Fannie, this is when they start to suffer losses. However, Ginny is different. Ginny is different than Fannie and Freddie. Ginny is not a GSE. Ginny was created in 1968 to help low-income borrowers that could not get these non that cannot get these conforming loans. They have non-conforming loans. They do not have medium incomes for uh, medium income borrowers. It's not a medium-sized loan. These are different. And because of that, they are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government and the issuer themselves. So the issuer themselves is going to be like the FHA, some portion of the executive branch of the U.S. government that did create this um, loan and originated themselves. So the idea is that Ginny's not going to um, have recourse against an issuer because the a recourse of the issuer would only come into play if the issuer is defaulted. So this right here, this purple box on the right hand side of your screen is indicative of the extra padding that Ginny has. Ginny securities are thus safer and they should trade at a lower spread if the characteristics are the same. However, remember again, Ginny May loans are non-conforming. They are not like the Fannie and Freddie's where they can be sold in TBA pools because they're pretty much all exactly the same. If Fannie and Freddie um, retain recourse against the servicer and seller, Fannie and Freddie are going to then um, retain recourse against the servicer and seller. Well, Ginny is not going to retain issuer. Uh, the Ginny only works with the issuer. There's not a servicer or seller. It's FHA. It's USDA. And Ginny must honor its guarantee irrespective of the state of collateral, while Fannie and Freddie can actually, or I guess, are obliged to actually pull them out of the pool if they are 90 days delinquent. Considering different pools for agency mortgage-backed securities, we see TBAs and SPECs. TBAs are the to-be-announced pools, which is the market to create unified parameters under which mortgage pools are, are considered fungible. This means that it is underpinned by the assumption of homogeneity. The idea is all the mortgages are effectively going to be the same when they're pooled together. So it doesn't really matter which exact mortgages are in the pool because they're sold on a TBA basis. TBA started with Ginny pass in 1970 because Ginny also has, although they're non-conforming, they can be sold in a TBA fashion. TBAs exist for all agencies and Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny, and they allow mortgage lenders to hedge origination, they can fund origination, and the most importantly, you are lowering borrowing costs because you're ensuing liquidity. The idea behind securitization more, more broadly, and the reason that it's so beautiful, is that you are adding liquidity to the market by taking things that were originally just savings and loan thrifts and independent mortgage markets, 
in significant individual regions, now broadening the scope and creating a worldwide market for these um, mortgage-backed securities. So the idea is that months prior to actual settlement, you can have a trade for TBAs. So only 48 hours before you're actually going to get the securities, like however many months later, you're going to actually figure out what is in them. The settlement date allows pools to actually be delivered and funds to be exchanged. However, only 48 hours before that will you know what's actually in the pool. This is T plus two settlement, which is very similar to FX. FX is oftentimes settled T plus two. Buyers of agency MBS. So pre-crisis and post-crisis, two different groups. Um, Pre-crisis, if you look to the year 2005, we see 0% held by REITs. This was before mortgage REITs uh, actually held this agency paper. In addition, we saw Fran Fannie and Freddie hold large uh, positions and um, places like the Federal Reserve not hold anything. As we move into the post-crisis era, we see that the Federal Reserve holds 17%. And this is particularly substantial as that's $1.5 trillion of purchases from January 2009 through March 2010. Post COVID, the Fed bought about $900 billion of agency MBS again. Um, between 2013 and 2016, they tried to roll out uh, quantitative easing and tried to sell off some of the stuff on their balance sheet. However, they didn't get rid of most of it, uh, a lot of it's still there. We have, what, seven, eight trillion dollars assets on the balance sheet right now, which is huge. And a lot of those apparently are agency mortgage-backed securities. Uh, this current cycle of purchases started in March. Uh, we're in August. I'm sorry. We are in September right now, but that figures from August, and this process is ongoing. Uh, purchases are from the New York Fed, so all the information can be found on the New York Fed's website um, in H41. Considering the other side of the RMBS market, let's look to private label RMBS. Private RMBS includes things like 40-year mortgages, which are obviously longer than the 15 or 30 fixed rate mortgages that can go into the agency MBS. We also have jumbo loans, things like ninja loans, where during the crisis, leading up to the crisis, you had a maximum amount of $415,000 that could go into regular loans. Now, Ginny, Fannie, and Freddie, or more applicably, Fannie and Freddie, have this conforming loan limit of $510,000, which means that the amount that you can have as a loan, um, so if it's a $600,000 house, and I guess that one word, if it is a what's that, $650,000 house, and you're putting up 20%, and you are um, getting a loan for the next 510, that's perfectly fine because that'll fit within the conforming loan limit, which means your loan originator, like Wells Fargo in that earlier diagram, can then sell this off to Fannie or Freddie, which will then include it in a primary issuance, assuming that you fit the following characteristics with an LTV below 80, a DTI of 36% or lower, which is your debt to income, LTV meaning loan to value of the property, and um, having a FICO of above 660. Also, having a high cost limit of $765,000 means that in high cost, expensive areas, that conforming loan limit has been raised. This is because properties in these areas are much more expensive. Um, also, considering things that go in the private RMBS market, we see things like Alt A's, where you have a higher LTV, but also a higher borrower quality. So you're not quite prime, you're not quite subprime, it's just a different category. Again, post crisis, most of these kind of zany uh, innovations in the mortgage space have not been as popular given heightened restrictions on the shadow banking community. Also, things like negative amortization loans, where you have low teaser rates and that's now illegal in 25 states, but that means there's 25 where it is legal, where you can have lower rates so low that you are actually increasing the amount of principal that's going to be due by making really small payments at the beginning. This is bad. This is typically known as predatory lending. It's a bad practice. However, um, it is still legal in some states. And considering Lyra loans, these are low documentation loans where you can apply with just your income and assets and you don't even need more complex um, background checks or FICO scores or more detailed information, which are, uh, you know, at the surface, pretty concerning. 
However, these things go into private label RMBS, obviously, because they're inherently oftentimes riskier and not backed implicitly by the US government, they trade on much wider spreads. Considering recent RMBS issuance, we see that uh, Freddie Mac dominates the market with large issuances of, what's that, about $900 million, uh, $900 million in each issuance. Fannie is also right up there with about a billion dollars in each issuance. Considering, um, this is in the trailing 12 month period, by the way. Considering banks like JP Morgan or shadow banking entities like New, Re New Residential Investment Corp or Lone Star Funds or uh, hedge funds and um, other pools of private capital, we see um, them deciding to issue their own RMBS private label. These transactions, as you can see, are often substantially smaller. Investment banks like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs also play in the space, but again, also on the smaller side. If I direct your attention to the chart on the bottom of your screen, you'll see huge rising trends in private label RMBS issuance going into 2019, obviously giving the illiquidity of markets in especially March and April 2020, we saw lower issuance across the board. However, in the back half of 2020, we've seen heightened issuance, and that's definitely something to watch, especially on the agency side. Given that mortgage rates are so low right now with sub 3% 30-year mortgages, we do see that it does make a little bit more sense, or I guess a lot more sense, for people to refinance. This makes a direct economic incentive for people to refinance, which obviously is going to increase that prepayment risk. However, when mortgages are over and you're getting a new mortgage, now you have a new mortgage that can now be sold into a new securitization and a new trust and a new um, set of procedures for this process. That means that there is going to be increased activity. To direct your attention to the left-hand side of your screen, this details FIFO score ranges. Considering the scores of 660 or higher, that's construed as prime. Prime borrowers can qualify for Fannie and Freddie and other GSEs, um, or I guess those are the only two GSEs, but can qualify for both Fannie and Freddie loans. Um, credit scores on the FICO scale range from 300 at the low end um, to a maximum of 850. So to consider um, ways to manage liquidity with repurchase agreements, let's look to the repo markets. Repo, like with treasuries in the world of mortgage-backed securities, is secured lending. And the idea is secured lending is going to be cheaper than unsecured borrowing by probably about LIBOR minus 10 basis points thereabout. Maybe not quite right now because LIBOR is, what, 24 basis points? LIBOR is basically zero. But considering... Um, that's, that's been the rule of thumb going back uh, historically. LIBOR's fallen about 110 basis points since the crisis in March 2020. Considering the um, idea behind a repo, the idea is that the seller on day one is going to lend a security to the buyer, the lender of funds, who is um, buying the security and will be lending the money in exchange. And the buyer will then give an upfront fee at the end, they will give another fee back in exchange for the original fee. This idea, I'm sorry, they will, sorry, on day one, the buyer is going to give a fee to the seller. On day 30, the buyer is going to return the security and the seller will provide the buyer with the original payment and give the notional value back, plus the haircut amount, which is representation of the size of the um, risk and I mean, it's a loan. The loans have interest. The idea is that I am giving you my collateral today at some premium. I am providing a service. This service here in this example has a value of $217,000. Considering risk for repos, it's about the same across the board between repos done and collateralized by MBS and collateralized by treasuries. We see credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, and settlement risk. The idea is it's credit of the counterparty. Um, what if my counterparty is not in business either overnight, which is the one day, um, more than one day, which is a term repo, you'll see it up to like 30 days or have like an open repo where you can have it up to, you can have it up to like three months, but it's typically up to 30 days. Uh, market risk, what if the value of my security changes? Liquidity risk, what if I can't sell my security afterwards? And settlement risk, um, what if the counterparty that's there to settle my security is not in business anymore? 
considering the right hand side of your screen, we'll see some key terms for repos and um, both those with MBS and with treasuries. And considering collateral, it can be your typical super secure agency paper. It could be AAA non-agency on the CMBO side. Um, again, most of our discussion today, because this is our first conversation about mortgage-backed securities, has been concentrated in the world of pass-throughs. But we could also have AA pass-throughs and whole loans collateralize these, um, have as MBS paper collateralizing these repos. The seller, really important here, the seller is going to receive the identical collateral at term maturity. This means at the end of the agreement, whether that's overnight, 30 days, whatever, 90 days from now, you're going to receive the same exact security. We're gonna go talk about dollar rolls in a second. And dollar rolls do not have this characteristic. Repo means identical collateral. Dollar roll does not have to be identical collateral. Dollar rolls are just something for mortgage-backed securities. The haircut is used by the lender or buyer to, um, which are synonymous terms, the lender of funds, which is the buyer of the security, to hedge against the decline in the market value, ranging from one to 50%. Usually it's gonna be between like one to 5%, depending on the term. And these securities are gonna be marked to market daily. And this is gonna to lead to margin calls if the value of the security is less than a certain threshold. And this is going to be cash settled at time T plus zero. This obviously is different than how TBA pools are settled, which is gonna be T plus two or FX contracts are settled, which is T plus two. This is mark to market, cash out of margin calls. Considering term, we've already touched on that. With title, the borrower loses the title to the security over the repo period. However, they retain access and rights to all payments of principal, scheduled and unscheduled, and have that forwarded to the original buyer. Um, we also have the idea of a reverse repo, which we'll go through in more detail in later lectures, where the buyer, the lender of funds can repo out the securities to borrow money through something called a repo book. As, uh, as expected, we'll go into dollar rolls right now, which is an alternative to repos for mortgage-backed securities. There are like repos, however, have two main differences. Firstly, the owner transfers the original securities cash flows to the temporary owner, assuming their record dates are passed, which they probably will be, um, because the term's usually about a month from what I've seen. It's like a, you do like a July, August roll, which would be a one month difference. Anyhow, idea, owner transfers the original securities cash flows. And number two, the return security does not have to be the same as the original security, but rather merely substantially similar. Considering this, what on earth does substantially similar mean? It needs to be either the, uh, I guess, both the original and return securities need to be of the same agency. So they need to both be Freddie Macs, uh, same program, which means they're from the same series. So they're a gold, uh, say they're a gold issuance. Uh, they need to have the same original maturity and same coupon. So we have the 30 year Freddie Mac gold fives and they also need to satisfy good delivery requirements. So the idea behind a dollar roll is that you're doing two simultaneous buy and sell orders for the same TBA security. And the great thing about this is you're avoiding taking delivery and still maintaining an attractive financing rate. This is awesome if you are long mortgage-backed securities and want to finance it, but still maintain the mortgage-backed security without having to take delivery for it. The idea is that dollar rolls can only use pass-throughs where repos can use any type of security and dollar roll funding because you're not going to take this um, delivery is often going to be substantially lower than that repo rate. Your repo rates can be related to your general collateral, but as mentioned, because this is a secured form of financing, is safer and is thus going to be cheaper than using some sort of unsecured funding rate like LIBOR. In addition, dollar rules uh, have principal and interest payments that go to the holder on each record date, as opposed to the repos where they go to the original owner. This is an incredibly important distinction to make, especially for things like mortgage-backed securities, which make these monthly payments. In addition, um, dollar rules do not have a haircut um, priced on them like repos would, but repos have identical securities returned, well, dollar rules don't. Dollar rules, obviously, because they are with, mul with mortgage-backed securities that are not necessarily going to be the same as the original security, um, have that prepayment risk because, like mentioned before, when you have a TBA pool, you're gonna 
imagine that you're going to get the worst. It's you're pricing it as if you're going to get the worst because the worst is probably going to be delivered. The worst thing that they can give you that fits these characteristics is going to be delivered. The worst set of prepayments, the worst set of uh, anything that can fit the constraints within the pool is going to be delivered. However, repo has um, no prepayment risk because that is the same security that's being delivered. So on the right-hand side of the screen, we'll walk through a transaction where you're buying 2 million of the July, August roll for the Freddie Mac Gold Fives, and you quote the drop, which means I'm saying, hey, down 10, 30 seconds. So the idea, as we touched on fixed income quotations last class, is fixed income is quoted as uh, some number over 32 at the end. So you'll say price of the bond is 101-09. 101 09 means it's a price of 101 and 930 seconds, together representing one price. So the 1030 second drop means that you are buying the 2 million of the July settlement at 95.29, and then you're going to simultaneously sell 2 million of the August settlement at 95.19. So this implied financing rate. Um, when these two things are almost equal, as shown in the example below in more detail, there's not going to be a material advantage when the role is dubbed at or near carry. So the idea is that you do this and earn a material advantage when you are not necessarily near carry. As um, stated before, on the repo side, you have these risk exposures to credit, market liquidity, and settlement. However, you do have this additional risk, which is noted right here of prepayment because the original securities do not have to be and probably won't be returned. All right, so I look forward to seeing you in next Sunday's lecture. Really enjoyed speaking to all of you tonight. Um, we'll cover CMOs, CDOs, strips, uh, ABX, and start off by talking about the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, by using that as an opener to different mortgage derivatives and I guess how things can go wrong there as well. All right. Well, outstanding. Thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of your evening.